And I wanted to start just by talking a little bit about um, mindfulness itself. What is mindfulness? And this is obviously a really vast and important topic, um, especially now as mindfulness has become so popular and so um, just recognized. Um, and having you know studied and trained in the Buddhist tradition and various schools of Buddhist thought, and then also have a, having a lot of appreciation and having studied with some of the early pioneers in the mindfulness movement, like Trudy Goodman, um, who grew up on the same street <laughs> as John Kabat-Zinn and was friends with he and Lama Surya Das as kids. Um, strangely enough, uh, it goes way back. And um, she ended up teaching with John um, in the basement of UMass in some of the first mindfulness-based stress reduction courses. Uh, and she was also my, uh, Emily and I's heart teacher, one of our core teachers. Um, and so I've been very much introduced to both the mindfulness practice and the secular frame, and as well as the, the Buddhist frame on this. And what I found is that um, those frames don't always agree on, on what it's meant by mindfulness. Uh, even within the Buddhist tradition, the different <laughs> schools don't agree. Sometimes even within a particular school, people don't agree. Um, so this is one of those terms, mindfulness, uh, translated from the, um, the Sanskrit Pali as sati, S-A-T-I. Uh, it's one of these terms that there's not a, a, a consensus about exactly what it means. Um, but there are some, some kind of interesting takes on this. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into super depth in this. I've, I've given a talk on this actually called Mindfulness Plus Plus, and I'll share that um, in the training materials if you want to go deeper on the on this. But my my way of relating to mindfulness is to see, okay, there are a lot of different ways of understanding this, and I don't know that one of them is the correct way. I don't think in those terms anymore. But uh, I do think each of them does reveal something interesting about mindfulness itself. And of course, I think here, m most of us are very familiar with the, the secular definition, um, John Kabat-Zinn's definition of mindfulness, you know, non-judgmental uh, awareness, moment to moment, um, bringing this kind of, kind of almost empty, uh, agendaless attention to whatever's present, uh, which also implies heartfulness, um, because to, do, to be able to do that, we have to be um, warm, you know, we have to actually of what's here to some degree, enough to, to tolerate its existence, certainly. Um, so I think that's implied in that definition, the non-judgmental awareness. Um, um, and it's very approachable, it's very accessible, it's very easy to see why that is a, a useful thing, especially when we live in a culture of hyper-distraction. Um, and so I think it, it's cool to see how that, um, that definition operates. And at the same time, and this is one of the critiques from the Buddhist side of the mindful, mindfulness, what, what An, Professor Anglade called the mindfulness wars, um, which is that the, the term sati also has the strong connotation of, um, of recollection or remembrance. Um, and you could say, well, you're just remembering to be aware, right? Remembering to come back and be non-judgmentally aware. That, and that is true. That's part of it is remembering to come back to what you're doing. Um, but the what of what we're doing changes depending on the frame that we're using to understand the practice. Uh, what in traditional Buddhist terms would be called the view, the wise or right or correct view. Um, and so I think the way that we view mindfulness is the way we practice mindfulness. Uh, and that, that's why the, these view and these definitions are quite important. Um, and, and from a traditional Buddhist perspective, part of what we're recollecting is we're recollecting the basic frameworks that help point out the different aspects of experience and the way that 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 our experience is constructed, or in this case, you know, in the social context, co-constructed. So uh, often, this is a reference back to traditional Buddhist teachings, um, and if you look at the actual overview of the um, the Satipatthana Sutta, and I'm going to recommend a particular translation here. It's freely available online. Uh, the Foundations of Mindfulness, Satipatthana Sutta, translated by uh, Jnana Sata Tara, uh, Buddhist monk. And I'll share the link with, with you uh, after the session is over. I'll share it in the training uh, group. Um, but if you look at the basic headers, you know, the, the, the main areas of, of practice, there are four primary 
uh, what are sometimes called foundations uh, or areas or categories of, of mindfulness. The first is contemplation of the body. And within that, you have mindfulness of breathing, postures of the body, mindfulness with clear comprehension, the reflection on the repulsiveness of the body, the reflection on the material elements, and the nine cemetery contemplations, which are kind of hard to do these days, unless you, I guess you could you know, pull up YouTube. One of my friends, Michael Taft, does a, something called the death sangha, and they often will contemplate kind of gruesome but real things on YouTube and use that as a meditation. Um, in, the, in the traditional context, they were actually meditating in the cemeteries. Um, the second foundation or the second category is the, the contemplation of feelings, which doesn't necessarily mean emotions. It's more the feeling tone, the quality of pleasant, unpleasant, or not really either, that charge or valence that experience carries with it, especially our physical experience. The third foundation is the contemplation of consciousness. What is consciousness in this context? And how do we investigate it, become mindful of it? Aren't we supposed to be cultivating non-judgmental awareness? Well, what is that awareness? What is consciousness? And then the final uh, foundation is the contemplation of mental objects. And this to me, most of all, although all of these refer to the view, this whole model is a view, uh, when we're practicing in the four foundations uh, way, we're also considering some of these other models like the five hindrances, uh, the five aggregates, the six internal and external sense bases, the seven factors of enlightenment and the four noble truths, these, all these core Buddhist teachings. Um, and so that's part of what's meant by the view is that we're, and what's meant, meant by remembering, we're remembering to pay attention to these things. We're remembering to see things from the point of view of these models uh, that point to something in our experience that have been handed down. There's something in the models like information, like a program that we can run in our own conscious experience. Um, and it reveals something, it reveals something very interesting uh, about experience, about the nature of experience. Um, and then I would also argue more on the critical side that it conceals things too. Whatever view you have will reveal some things. You know, if you're standing and looking, say in a particular place in this room, in the room you're in, you look around, it's gonna reveal certain things, right, in the room. You're going to see certain things and things are up close and things are far away. You're going to hear certain things and sense certain things because of where you are. But at the same time, other things will be out of view that you won't be able to see, like what's behind you, for instance, uh, or in my case, what's behind the computer here that I'm looking at. Um, so every point of view uh, reveals and conceals. It's the nature of perspective. Uh, and so, in some ways, the early tradition is making a truth claim here that they have the ultimate view uh, on what to look for. And I would argue that that is not the case because they're describing it in words. <laughs> and these words are, uh, are, are conditioned uh, as are, all things are conditioned. The view itself is conditioned. But the view of this conditional view is meant to point to something very interesting and unique, which is what we could call the unconditioned, uh, that which, uh, as the Buddha described, isn't born and doesn't die, doesn't come into form, isn't affected by the perspective that you take, and isn't a thing, isn't actually an experience at all. Um, of course, this is still part of the view, <laughs> what I'm describing here, <laughs> if you want to get trippy, um, the view that there is, a, there is a possible experience from which there is no point of view. Um, the unconditioned view. Um, and why is this important? Well, in mindfulness practice and in, early, in the early tradition, it's important because there's this recognition of suffering. You know, that, and, and, and suffering is not something we're going to get rid of or get away from. Uh, it's not possible. There's a, certain, there's a certain amount of pain and difficulty and struggle that just, and dissatisfaction that just comes with being freaking alive. <laughs> you know, being born in a, in a human body and um of course there's all, all sorts of great things too joyful things and beautiful things it's not denying that um, but it's just recognizing that that all um comes with a caveat you know there's this ultimate caveat <laughs> that um that life is challenging 
And so in mindfulness practice, we're working with that challenge. And there is a possibility to be free in the midst of suffering, uh, in the midst of pain, to discover an un unconditional freedom or what Shinzen Young, American Dharma teacher, he calls the happiness that's independent of conditions. And it seems to me in my reading of the early tradition that they're very interested in that, very interested in this, uh, this transcendent happiness, um, this freedom from, you could call it, freedom from conditional pain and suffering. And so part of the way the tradition is framed is it's about becoming free from suffering, from the unnecessary parts sufferings. Can't come, come free of all of it, unfortunately. Um, I'm looking for a quote here. Where is it? This is part of it. This is Dukkha right here. I can't find what I'm looking for. It's causing me stress. Yeah, this is the way it is. <laughs> um, what I wanted to share here is a, a quote from um, David Loy, uh, one of my teachers and friends. And um, he's a Zen teacher and philosopher. And he writes quite critically of the early tradition while also really appreciating it. And he says, like other axial developments, Buddhism basically rests on cosmological dualism. For Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, that dualism is God in heaven, a realm separate from this world. In the case of Buddhism, it's samsara versus nirvana, depending on how you understand the relationship. The Buddha himself didn't offer many details about nirvana, as if he intentionally didn't want to provide foods for speculation. On the popular level of understanding, however, Buddhism devalues this world as a place of suffering, craving, and delusion. And the goal of Buddhist practice is to transcend it. But what does transcend it mean? Escaping to some other reality or realizing the true nature of this world? And so, uh, and when he says Buddhism, I think what he's really referring to is early Buddhism. Because Buddhism itself has evolved and changed, and not all Buddhisms have the same view about, um, about this. Some, some Buddhisms are more what are called non-dual traditions that don't see samsara and nirvana as being separable. Um, uh, as Nagarjuna said, nirvana and samsara are one. There's no uh, nirvana apart from samsara, because it's not a thing. It's not an experience. So where would it be? Where's it gonna exist? Outside? Somewhere? Where is this outside? Show me. <laughs> Show me. And so um, in this exploration together, the Satipatthana Sutta, um, as I said, we'll, we'll, we will bring in some critical attitudes about what parts of this practice and this view are helpful for us to adopt in our current conditions. And I mean you specifically in your current conditions. For some of you, maybe it is helpful to, to think about mindfulness as transcendence. You know, perhaps that actually gives you a kind of drive to practice. And perhaps you're suffering as I was when I first started practicing and you want to not be suffering. Um, that is a powerful driver, um, the desire for relief. And of course, it's natural for us to want to transcend our suffering, to uh, transcend our pain. Um, and, and to me, that, that fuel can get us pretty far in certain ways on the path. Um, in terms of the discipline of meditation. But it's ult uh, ultimately where I would like to take this is, is beyond the kind of um, cosmological dualism to more, more of a non-dualism, looking at how these practices can be brought into our lives as they are. Um, perhaps it's not helpful, for instance, if you're dealing with body uh, issues to be contemplating the repulsiveness of the human body. You know, that could compound suffering. Um, um, this, these practices were developed primarily for men um, to 2,500 years ago. And um, so we have to understand this tradition in its historical context um, and that it wasn't necessarily developed for folks uh, like ourselves who are living and breathing and working in the world and dealing with all kinds of you know, um, challenges. Um, we're not renunciates, most of us. And so... Uh, I think this view, the foundations of mindfulness, um, 
is per perhaps not going to completely apply to us. Um, and yet, there's some really profound and powerful things in these practices, in this, in this tradition, in this model. One of my favorite things about the early Buddhist tradition is its emphasis on impulse control, you know, on learning how to like notice an impulse to do something and not do it. Um, like how much suffering and how much pain is this caused by people really not like being able to do that? Um, certainly as you're like younger, like that's one of the main things we learn. How do you control your impulses instead of, you know, just interrupting someone when they're talking? How do you like, wait, wait for your turn? You have to have some amount of mindfulness. You have to know what's coming up. You have to feel your impulse and then you have to notice it and let it go. Um, that is incredibly helpful. And I'd say it's even, it's, it's even, it's even more helpful now since we're, um, having to hack back against so many forces that are trying to, um, to grab our attention and to capture it, um, you know, it, it, it's in a way a rebellious act to to have impulse control, um, and so I think that's one of the things I want to appreciate about the early tradition, you know, um, uh, and it, of course it can go too far. <laughs> so, so, um, so over the next several weeks, we're going to be kind of exploring that, um, you know, what what are the pros and cons of of working off of this particular model. And what is mindfulness? You're coming back to the present moment, but how and to what? How are we looking at this present moment? What are we seeing in the moment? How do we describe this experience? Um, all of that to me goes into the question of what is mindfulness? Uh, what is it that we're remembering to do or to not do um, in this practice? <laughs>